morning, everybody. Very nice to see everybody on this Golden Buddha morning. Golden Buddha is a new long tea. This is number two in a series of nine consecutive oolong teas. Last week, we took uh, a journey with Golden Osmanthus. And Golden Osmanthus is a southern Fujian oolong. And as we discussed last week, this is a simpler type of oolong to make. So, so simple that in fact, you can basically get it done within 24 to 30 hours or so. Now we're shifting to a more complex oolong and we're shifting to the area of the birthplace of oolong. And we're gonna spend a number of weeks in this birthplace because there's lots to talk about. There's a lot to talk about in terms of the history. The processing modality all by itself is incredible. There are, in the best of the teas, 30 steps and done over a seven month period. And traditionally, the best of the craftsmen used to take up to a year to make it. And we'll talk a little bit about that because I'm first gonna start off with shop news. And then I'll link that to the statement I just made, because this week we had a young person come in. He spoke real good Chinese, Westerner. His Chinese was so much better than mine. It was, it was just remarkable. And, you know, he'd spent time in China. So it was really great. Love that energy of the youth and the time and the experience, and he just knew everything. And it was really great to encounter somebody who knew everything. So during the course of drinking, and so he wanted a clip tea. And so we're going around the board. And then when I was distracted, he talked to the tea master and he said, tell me how this is made. Tell me the process, the methodology of how this is made. Because once I understand that, I'm sure I'll be able to do it. Now, of course, all of you are thinking to yourselves, uh-oh, we might have a problem. So let's talk about all the ways we might have a problem. Now, remember, I said that this guy's Chinese was real good, much better than mine. And I linked it to this story. So problem number one, this implies that all you have to do in order to understand Chinese tea is to speak real good Chinese. So let's think about this. Let's think about this theorem for a minute and let's see if this makes sense. So if I took one of you and flew you into, where do I want to fly you? Maybe Qingdao. Qingdao is a beautiful place. And you've heard of Qingdao beer and so forth. Beautiful place in uh, Northern China. And I just put you in the middle of a square and I said, well, all of these guys and gals who are walking around here are native, so they speak real good Chinese. So why don't you pick one of them and let's go make tea. Would that be successful? And the answer is no. Because remember, this is not related to a gene in a person's makeup. It's also not related to the language. I mean, language is part of the cultural terrain, but having the language doesn't mean you have all the elements to belong to this cultural terrain. So that was the first thing that was wrong with this statement. The second thing is, and, and the, why am I spending time with this? I'm spending time with this because there is 
the Betty Crocker assumption. And so let's talk about that. Oh, wait a minute. Some of you are probably too young to know Betty Crocker. I probably shouldn't have used that one. Uh, let's use somebody else. Oh, Martha Stewart. Okay. Because everybody knows Martha Stewart. There's the Martha Stewart assumption. And that is, if you just give me a recipe book, I can get it done. Not only can I, I'm American. Of course I can get it done. I'm creative. I can get that methodology taken care of and produce something that is similar or equivalent to what's being done in China. So we're going to find out in a minute why that's completely wrong and why the thought process about that is completely wrong. Where do I want to start with all the reasons that that's wrong? Let's start with physical terroir. So the physical terroir of the Wui Mountains, especially in deep in the mountains, in the World Heritage Site, consists of lots of nooks and crannies. So what do I mean by that? You got these volcanic mountains rising out of the landscape. And so you have strange configurations related to the path of the sun, related to the fog. Some places get four to five hours of sunlight and that's it. Some places get much more sunlight. The fog is anywhere from 100 to 150 days a year. And so there's different configurations of that because some places get a lot more fog than other places. So there are elements of this terroir that once you go to the table and say, oh, I'm going to make this tea. If you don't understand and haven't been watching, how are you going to get the best results? In a way, it's again like taking a Martha Stewart recipe or a Betty Crocker recipe with the added consideration that for the wheat you use, you got to be out there watching and you got to understand what that terroir is, how much sunlight, how much roundup, how much, oh, wait a minute, that, that last comment didn't belong in this, so let's strike that. How much fall? Oh, I mean, all the things that wheat farmers would have to deal with. But no, we have industrialized it, and therefore, we have a way to make recipes that are generalized, and we can do that. And the flavor is going to be within a range. You don't have that with Cliff Tea. And that's why the LCS component of Cliff Tea is so stark. Okay, so if I'm an LCSer, what do I want to do if I'm going to try and bake Cliff Tea? I actually can tell you what you're going to do. And that is, you're going to get all these tea leaves from wherever you get them. You're going to go through certain processes to make them semi-oxidized. And at the end, what you're going to do is you're going to roast the heck out of it so that all you can taste is roast. You're going to put, oh, this is from the special wooing mountains. And then you're going to put a price tag of $2,000 a pound or $5,000. Now, this would be great. And it's great for people who have never drunk tea before, so they don't know the difference. But for anybody who's had true clip tea, right away, you know, oh, some LCS or did this. This does not belong. I'm not getting any other flavor. Nothing else is coming through. And there's no sophistication to the roasting. So this is one of the elements that if you don't understand as somebody within the Wui Mountains, okay, well, this tea had less sunlight 
therefore I'm going to roast it a certain way to get a certain result, or this tea had more fog this year, I'm going to oxidize it less or more to get a certain result. If you don't know these things, how can you get any good result? The great results that we have in the cliff teats are the result of lineages of farmers who control the cliff teats within the Wui Mountains. So I ask you this, do you think that it's easy to go and go into the farm and say, oh, Mr. Farmer or Miss Farmer, you know, can I watch your process? You can actually do that. You can actually go to the farms and, and do that. And remember last week when we talked about Golden Osmanthus, Biju and I actually spent more than 30 hours. So we saw the whole process. And at each step, we we're taking good notes, taking pictures. Yeah, we understand that process pretty well. If we were going to try and fake an oolong, this would be the only possibility of one that we might be able to fake. What is the difference with the cliff teats? I led us off in the beginning. They take seven months to produce. Who has the time and the patience to go through seven months of observation? So that's the first reason. You're never going to get anybody who knows the complete process, no matter how good their training is. Ain't going to happen. That's the first thing. Second thing, when you go up into the Wui Mountains and you talk to the farmers, now we've been going back and forth for 25 years or so, and we have these deep friendships, and we understand the technical questions to ask, and we've been showing at one time or another all the steps, but we haven't been shown one master farmer from start to finish, seven months, we've not done that. We can tell you, and by the way, because we have the relationships, they tell us more and more. And so year by year, we learn more and more. And that's why we realize, oh, I didn't know very much before. I still don't know very much. I'm still learning. Every year we learn a lot because it's subtle secrets that they release. And they trust us. They trust that we're not going to go out and try and undermine the market. More than that, more than trust, they also know there's no chance. There is zero chance. Cannot do it because we don't have the right to run. We don't understand yet all the conditions, every single condition that can influence, because there's so many conditions. And every year that the weather is different or that the growth pattern is different, they do something a little different. We pick it up when we're there at that time for that step, for that year. But how does it affect 10 steps down the line? Don't know. Can't tell you. We can ask the questions, they'll give us an answer. But do we know it in a way that we ourselves could say, pick an ice volcanic spot on the big island of Hawaii, you know, plant a similar varietal, watch it grow, harvest it, and then produce a clip tea. Answer is no. And this is why when we're asked, well, why is the price of some of these things so high? Well, it's high, a seven-month process for the best of the clip teeth. 
And that's the cliff tease deepest within the World Heritage Site. Is the cliff tea that we're having today, Golden Buddha, from that deepest of the sites? No, it's not. It's from half in the mountain. And remember, I've talked to you about outside the mountain. That's where LCSers live. You, you have legitimate outside the mountain, which is, say, right there next to the Wuyi Mountains. Okay, that's kind of legitimate because you get a little bit of that terroir. But then way outside of the mountain, say Sichuan province, some other province, no, you're not going to be able to reproduce. Well, what about high mountain tea? Now, isn't that a semantics thing? It's a semantics thing if you're going to try and trick people. But it's not a semantics thing if you understand that in Taiwan, they call that that is harvested from certain mountains in Taiwan, high mountain, long. And you know automatically that that means roughly a 30 hour process, 30 to 40 hours, and then a month before it gets on the market. You know this from how it's talked about. The cliff teas in Fujian, Wuyi Mountains, do they ever call those high mountain Uwans? The answer is no. That term is never used. And yet, let me add something. Are some of those teas growing at an elevation that's as high, if not higher, than that in Taiwan? And the answer is yes. Therefore, if I were a newbie or an alien who just landed on Earth and said, oh, that's high elevation, 50, or they wouldn't say 50, Wulong Tea. But that would be wrong because the local population, the tea industry, and at the end of the day, consumers know it as Cliff Tea. That's where that terminology comes from because it's growing on the cliffs it's rocks that are important in the flavor that's where you get that minerality yes you and dj have explored teas also in india and just educated yourself about who's growing elsewhere more broadly are is there ever any attempt to pass off a, a tea grown in india as a so-called high mountain tea, or do the fakes come from, from, tend to come from other locations? For cliff teas, the fakes come from within China and within Taiwan. Those are the two major places where fakes. It would be an astounding reach. It, there's a word, chutzpah real bravado in a bad way, trying to pass off something that it's not. So India, no. Nepal, no. Hawaii, no. You know, I didn't bring up the big island of Hawaii by accident. Biju and I visited two or three years ago, and we went to see the tea farms, and they are making the tea there as a form of oolong tea. There appears to be something, nothing wrong with the tea leaves themselves. In other words, they're interesting. Are they the same as the cliff teas? No, but they're interesting. Is the technique that they're using mature? No, it's not mature. So therefore, we could never have one of those on this board because you would say, what happened to you guys? Look, you're getting old, you just lost your ability to pick teas or something, it wouldn't taste in that class. You guys are special. You're real special because you taste. And during this nine weeks, we have three in the next session that are all in the most interior of the Wuyi Mountains. And so you're going to get this chance 
to taste these three very special cliff teas. Today, you're getting one half in the mouth. It's special. I'll tell you why it's special in a minute. But it's not the same specialness as those ones in the deep, deep in the interior. And these years, by the way, we go more and more in the interior and don't take anything that's not from the interior because after all, you guys are discerning and you want really good. Yes. What does half in the mountain mean? Ah, so I use this term. I'm wondering if I made it up half in the mountain. The answer is no, I did not make it up. They actually have a Chinese term which says something like ban, ban shan, and ban is actually the physical word for half of anything. And what that means is it isn't in that 7.7 .7 square kilometer most famous area where you charge thousands of dollars per pound for the tea because it's so special. The terroir is so interesting. You're outside of that area. However, let's think about this a minute because, you know, there's some contradictions here. Let's, let's think about the chief contradiction. What if I'm in that 7.7 .7 square kilometer? And, you know, I've measured it real carefully and I know what the borderline is. And I put one foot over the borderline because I see an interesting, an interesting tea plant and pick that. Now, officially, I can't call that within the mountain. However, is it close enough that it mostly captures some of the same flavors? And the answer is yes. And that's why this sense of within the mountain, half within the mountain is really important because at some point you have to understand that the best producers are all within the mountain. The people who are half in the mountain are good. They're real good. But are they the very best? And the answer is no. So Golden Buddha is in that half mountain. And actually, most people in the world, if they tell you, yeah, I've had good 50 before, they've usually drunk from half in the mountain. And it is good. It's real good, as you'll see today. It's just different than what you're going to see starting next week. Because next week, we're going to get something that, oh, I don't have to step across that magic line. I'm still within the magic line, and I'm going to get enlightened. You're going to get enlightened next week. Literally and figuratively. So... By the way, and this is why you're taking good notes, because as we go through these cliff teas, this gives you context. It gives you scale, scope. That's what you're getting here. Because we don't just have one cliff tea. Ooh, and we don't just have one really great in the mouth of cliff tea. We have stuff you can compare. And that's what the journey is that you're on. So I blathered away for a long time. And let's see my, uh, let's see how long I, oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, how do I want to start? Remembering that I have so many weeks to cover this that we're not in a hurry. So I'm going to tell you about this area. And then I'm going to have Biju come up and brew for you. So this area is about 3,000 feet above sea level. And when you walk in this area, it's fairly well manicured. So what do I mean by that? The bushes, while they follow the contours of the mountains, they are actually bushes that you can tell are really planted and cared for. As you get deeper into in the mountain, there's less of that uniformity. 
So this is actually an example of where more uniformity actually in some ways is of lesser quality. Not by a lot, but by a little. And so in this area, you don't have a lot of other plants growing as well. But as you cross over into the in, in the mountain area, you have everything growing there. Bushes of all sorts of other things, along with tea bushes. So you've got influence in the mountain. You have less influence once you get outside of in the mountain. So that's the first thing to understand. Second thing. When the farmers go up there, are they haphazard in their picks? And the answer is no. No farmer makes a haphazard decision about the pick. So in this case, it was a bud and three leaves. Why did they decide three rather than, hey, let's take a bud and a leaf or a bud and two leaves? Or better yet. No buds. Let's just take five or six leaves. You have to have a certain balance. And by the way, is this a traditional Wu tea? It's made in the traditional manner, but this is a relatively new hybrid. This was hybridized in the 1950s. So it's been around for 70 years. But pre- 1950s, it wasn't around in this form. So that's another area which as we move forward in these nine weeks, you're not going to see these hybrids. You're going to see more traditional and especially as you get in the mountain. This became a favorite and you'll see why when we taste this. And by the way, I emphasize since we're on this leisurely journey through the Wulans, let's make sure we take good notes because these things really are different. And as you can address the difference, context becomes meaningful for you. Yes. And when you talk about like in the classes on Yunnan reds, we talk about rinsing, seeing the most of the nutritional elements and the seeds of the reds and their flowers, rarely and rarely. What types of plants are generally used or considered beneficial for influencing the flavor of the producer? They tremendously awesome leaf. Great question. So the question is in the past, with the ancient tree, the Yunnan, we talk about the ferns, we talk about uh, the magnolias, we talk about the fruit trees that grow in the forest and influence the flavor profile of ancient trees. So the questioner says, what exact plants are making these in the mountain cliff teas so good? And it's not fruit trees. It's by and large flowers. You have lots of flowering bushes. And a, this whole set of flowering bushes that grows in and around the tea bushes. By the way, the other thing which is very important to note is that the tea bushes are older the further in the mountain you get. The ones that are half in the mountain tend to be those that are under 30 years old. Once you get in the mountain, you're going to be talking 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old. All right. So I think the tea master has been already indicating that I'm over talking, even though that we're having the leisurely pace. She's saying too leisure and she's thirsty. And she says, you guys are really thirsty. So, you know, we're so lucky today to have the white, shiny tea master. 
who numinous tea master who will do the golden Buddha with you. Thank you. But today I'm changing. I'm, yeah, changing. You know, the, I really, really, I miss another, another tea factory in Wuyimangu. So right now, no, so this is called Gongfu Cha Ha, Gongfu Cha, we call Gongfu Cha, same rhythm, yeah. So this is my tea pot, this is here, American tea pot, this is Chinese tea pot. Oh, so, so the Gongfu, let me give you context here. The Gongfu here actually is a play on words. In Chinese, it really means master. Mastery of a craft, that's what it really means. So when you are master of a fighting craft, that's Kung Fu. Master of tea craft, there can be Kung Fu. It also implies the small pot, small cup style from the Wuyi Mountains. So there's, there's kind of that play on words that Biju was just referring to. Whatever we do with the large Asian yeah. pot yeah. is a re replica. It's the same as yeah. what we're doing with, small. and what they're doing in China with the small pot. We're using a larger cup. We have supersized for the urban market. So and calling you, the 16 ounce yes. pot of an American style was a, a joke and that provides context for sure. Yes, absolutely. And given this stock, it, within the Wuyi Mountains, they have no interest in doing large cup. However, the tea shops outside of the Wuyi Mountains, they love what we're doing. The tea industry people love what we're doing and want to see more of this because they think this is their future in China. Because when you're urban busy, do you have time to sit around for a couple hours and do small cup? Most of the time, the answer is no. You do on the holidays, but you don't on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you are addicted to clip tea, that means you want it every day. And you don't have that two hours. We provide the antidote. All right. So the tea master has heated both the inside and the outside of the Yixin pot. If you're using an Yixin pot, you would do the same. If you're using a ceramic, you would do the same. Why? Oolong tea loves heat. It loves the concentration of heat. The way it is made is designed to get the juices baked on and you get those juices when you use high heat, 100 degrees, and when you make sure it's as concentrated as possible. So that's what the tea master is doing here. Outside and inside to make sure that this is as hot as possible. The, as uh, she's drying 200 degree water, and by the way, while I was talking, she heated the glass, made sure the glass was clean as well. And now she's using a kettle with a spout and pouring it in in a directed way, controlled way, I should say. Covers it up. We set the timer for two minutes. Okay. You, so, all, you also sent photos. I did send photos. What's the story behind some of those photos? So those photos are the back end of the interior of the mountain. And that's why we sent those photos because tea grown as you look up the mountain would be half in the mountain. And then as you cross into the mountain, you would be in the mountain. And so there's a famous river, the Nine Bend River, which runs there. That was part of those photos. And when over the years, they have had different places you could enter the river. Now, there's been one, always one very traditional place that you could enter the river and go down a raft, and they have these tours and so forth. 
But there were other places over the years in the Dindiba where you get on another type of boat and there's a tea master who makes the tea while you're on the boat and you're sitting there and some of them sing and, you know, it's a small cup and you just fall in love with the surroundings because you're going down and it's it's like Yosemite. The air is good, the water is clear, and you're looking around at these strange boulder configurations and mountain configurations. It's a trip like no other. So it's very appropriate that the tea is like no other. I mean, it really matches the whole atmosphere. And that's what those pictures were designed to show because the, the sense of time timer is up, the sense of the area is magical. And you get that sense when at any part, part of the park, whether you're in the mountain itself or whether you're on the river or you're climbing up on one of the trails, you're going to one of the monasteries. It's magical at every step of the way. So the timer went off. The tea master poured it out. Remembering, we're doing this at 200 degrees. What does that mean? That means you can't take a big sip. That means danger. You have to take a small inhalation. You don't want to burn those valuable tools, those taste buds in your mouth. Look at this color. So we know some stuff right away. Since we know that this is a wooey tea and we see this color, we right away surmise, hmm, there might be a little roast to this. The answer would be yes, there is. We're going to enter, well, you're not going to enter yet. I'm going to enter the quality arena and I'm going to test and ascertain and take notes about the astringency and where it is, the dryness in the mouth. It's going to be different for everybody, so don't worry if your feeling of where it is is different than mine or somebody else's. Not an issue. Then we're going to see if there's an aftertaste and what it is. And then lastly, we'll start to get a sense of the energetics. And by the way, if you don't get a sense of the energetics, nothing wrong with you. We are all sensing this different. What's beautiful? And it was really interesting because yesterday, and I know I'm talking instead of doing this. I'll stop talking in a minute. Yesterday, we were having a conversation about the term umami. And it's just like with fruity and floral because we are still, as a tea drinking community, trying to get our arms around what we mean by the use of language. It's really hard because we interpret what we taste so differently sometimes. Does that mean what we taste really is different? No, not necessarily. It means the language around it. We learn different languages. And that's why this is so confusing sometimes. That's why wine is so confusing. Anything that you're using a language and you're trying to explain to other people, you need to have a series of things and then to a series of things. That's ridiculous. A series of terms that you use and then you keep parsing them. You keep parsing them until, hey, I get you now. We're crossed over. You're saying one thing, I'm saying another, but here's what we need. All right. So let me enter the quality arena. This is a 200 degree inhalation. Okay. I already have a sense of where the astringency is in the mouth. My mouth. I'm going to take another sip. I'm going to verify that. 
I'm still working on the aftertaste. I don't have the energetics yet, but I will, because I remember that there are energetics associated with this tea. So I've got a start. And part of that start also just now is aroma and taste. I'm going to take one more, and then it'll be your turn to brew. Okay, it's your turn to brew. Cindy asks, so do they get rid of the non-producing trees and root plants, uh, even if on a 40-year cycle? What is the norm? That's a great question. So Cindy's question has to do with how do farmers evaluate age of plants and what they should do with them? So if it's within the mountain, that's a much harder evaluation than it is outside of the mountain. Outside of the mountain, because those are more cultivated and arranged, the farmer makes the decision and they make the decision on yield. If the yield is good, they keep using them. If the yield is declining, they usually then will, in a pattern, start to replace. This gets real complicated once you're amidst other plants. And basically, when you're amidst other plants and you are within the mountain, unless the bush slash tree is dying, you, by and large, leave it alone. If it's completely not producing, then you might think of, okay, I got to do something. But normally, you just keep, this is, it's more an art within the mountain than it is a agricultural science or a routine. Outside within the mountain, it's more of a routine. They know on average, certain varietals are going to be good in terms of yield and flavor for X number of years. And as the farmer detects that, okay, the Northwest quadrant, I need to replace those. They take them out. And it's usually, uh, it takes about three years for the tea plants to start producing uh, once they plant new ones. So uh, it's, it's not a completely standard answer across all the areas and and history, custom, and in some ways, think about here and how we think of sequoia trees. If you should have a sequoia tree on the property, you wouldn't normally be allowed to just cut that anytime you felt. The community would have some influence into your removing or trimming even because it's kind of a cultural artifact. Well, the tea bushes within the mountain are cultural artifacts. Some of those are five or 600 years old. And so you're in a world heritage site. You don't just wake up one morning, God darn it, this plant isn't producing enough. Quink, it's chopped and gone. That would get you a visit. And in the Wui Mountains, those type of visits are probably less fun than most of the visits you might get. So that's the principle to think about. If you think about it that way, you'll always have a fair sense of what they're really how they're really thinking. You've spoken before about the fact that the there are the uh, scientists uh, scientists sponsored by the government or operating in the Catholic government to try to help with production and just understanding the tea um, are studying and, and and taking stock and trying to support farmers in some way. Are they giving special focus to the Wuyi Mountains when it comes to studying? Um, the response of 
the plants to uh, being trimmed or being and great the question. Great question. So the the questioner is talking about what role do scientists play in advising about either replanting or cutting or trimming? Because obviously over these years, it's not obvious. Let me say it this way. Over these years, scientists have become more and more involved in the lives of the farmers. And that involvement has consequences because they make recommendations. Are the farmers, let's see, is the voice of the science, scientists the law or do farmers have some say? The way science, especially agricultural science is done in China, the scientists really try to work real, real closely with the farmers. And they understand that at the end of the day, this is a dollars and cents business. And therefore, they're not insensitive to that. And so actually, before they ever introduce anything to farmers in terms of new hybrids, they test for all of that, that all of those things, yield, pest resistance, drought tolerance, all of those aspects. Does it fit well with the terroir? How long is it going to have a good yield? So usually the scientists who are working on, especially in this area, it takes 20 to 30 years before they introduce new hybrids, usually. Uh, very rarely is it any less because you've got to take long cycles. This isn't, you cannot use AI to play through this cycle in 20 minutes. Cannot happen. They've got to see the real conditions and they've got to keep measuring those real conditions. The, and I really like this question because I, I think that here, yes, we take advantage and use knowledge that scientists offer us, uh, particularly in the agricultural area. And if one is part of the industrial agricultural area, then there's probably a little more usage of some science in order to increase yield or resist pests. But in China, it's not, especially in the tea industry, these scientists are up there with small farmers, large farmers, and there are no real huge farmers. So it's a different feel and vibe. And there's, in some ways, and this is going to sound strange, and that's why I'm even hesitant to say it this way, but in some ways, you the two are interlocked as friends, allies, and both are interested in the economic long-term result. Why are they both interested? The farmer, it's obvious, because it's their livelihood. The scientists actually get rewarded for doing things that are beneficial for the economy. So you have, that's built into the system. It's not like here where science is for science sake and you develop interesting things. And yes, you also develop things that are good for the economy, but you're not necessarily tied so closely. In China, they're tied real, real closely, yes. Aggie observes about this tea, what a beautiful color in the liquor. Dry heated leaves had a strong roasted scent with coconut. The wet leaves had a subtle sweet corn aroma. It also let me know there'd be nice minerality, which really comes through in the tea liquor. Other flavors were caramel and chocolate, like a lovely dessert. Love this 
big description that Aggie has given because she starts with the dry, moves to the wet, and then goes through the, the tea liquor. So with the dry, there was something about coconut and what was the other thing? Coconut? Oh, roasted scent and ah, roasted and coconut. So let's start there. That is, and, and actually Aggie's opening remark was about the color. The color is remarkable. remarkable. And what's also remarkable, when you look over it, it's really clear. It's really clean. So it's roasted and coconut to start off with. The wet leaves have some, some chocolate. The subtle sweet corn ah, aroma. That's right. Subtle sweet corn aroma. I love this description. You normally would not hear a Chinese person say this, but we're different cultures. So we're using words and we mean the same thing. So they might say almost a soyness, but you call it a cornness. And that I like that. I grok that and you're on you're on target. The liquor itself, hints of chocolate, caramel. Oh, and minerality. My goodness. Even though this is only half in the mountain, it's got everything. Minerality, chocolatiness, roastiness, corniness. Oh, wait a minute. Shouldn't say it like that. Cornness. Uh, it's and it's rich. It's got a whole panoply. So this producer is a fabulous producer, even though they're only half in the mountain. Yeah, I had to step across that magic line. You still get the fullness and interestingness, and you get it at a level you're not paying a thousand dollars a cup. Yes. Peter shares, I find it slightly drying. And I'm not going to say it coats as much as there's a consistent thickness throughout the sip. I also am waiting to discover the energetics, which aren't so apparent in the initial sip or two. So Peter comments, energetics aren't immediately rockable. They're not immediately available. So he's opened his mind to be waiting patiently for the energetics to show up. And I think that's the same approach I'm taking. Uh, I'm, By the way, I'm beginning to get them now. But when I first sipped it, I didn't get anything. I couldn't detect anything. Further, uh, he noted there was one other thing. That was that of the thickness. There's a ah, consistent right. thickness throughout the sip. A consistent thickness throughout the sip. So why do I like this? Because... It leaves an aftertaste on your tongue. It leaves that flavor and it's it lingers. And that's because of the thickness. Great catch on that. Yes. Rob shares, the tea water has the scent of honey, plum, and the aroma uh, warmly and gently embraces my sinuses. Tea water, honey, and plum, and the warmth of it embraces the sinuses. Rob makes this comment, and I like it. And the Chinese would very nearly say much the same thing. Now, some Chinese would actually say, instead of plumminess, they would say slight hint of floral. So you... But this is language. This is differing language for the same scent. This is what's happening. You, you all are saying the same thing, actually. And I'm loving this because you're using the different words as you grasp around. And you are actually detecting a lot of different things. That's the beauty of this thing. That's one of the beauties of this thing, of this tea. It is that it isn't single note. It isn't, oh, this is all roast and nothing but roast. This has a lot going on with it. Yes. Actually, to that point, Andy shares, 
the roast and minerality are supporting flavors on the background to the sweeter flavors others have noted at the front. Love this. So the, oh, great comment. The roastiness is supporting in the background other flavors. Aside from that sweet, plummy, uh, entry flavor. And I love how you frame that because you're tasting down into this tea. You're using the techniques we use to make a determination of, do we want this tea? Is it going to age well? Are other flavors going to come to the core? And when we taste down, we're tasting exactly for this because when we taste that, oh, we can get this because in two years, there's going to be other flavors that are coming up to the fore. Yes. Peter says it was a savory talk today. <laughs> so Peter made a funny uh, comment about a savory talk today. And uh, one of these sessions, we're going to get deep into the word savory and we're going to get uh, deep into the word umami. Not today, but this is what that was a reference to. Uh, Jan shares, for me, it was mostly sweet. On the nose, I got a lot of toasted wheat berries and cherries. For the tea water, I got cherries, plums, and blackberries, coupled with some background notes of caramel and toasted sesame seeds. lot going here on here with Jen's comment, and I love it, because she captured a flavor that none of you have said using the same word, but a couple of you have said using a different word, and it's the wheat berry. I love that she's not, that was an aroma, right? Uh, the wheat berry is, let's see, let's see, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. yes, on the nose. Yep. On the nose, yes. And uh, so Aggie had cornness. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, Aggie had, had cornness. Right? Uh, Jen has the wheat berry. We're all in the same uh, arena here. And then on the tea water itself, she talks about cherry, uh, plum. Uh, Black. hmm? And blackberry. Blackberry, yes. So there is a strong uh, stone fruit slash berry that many of you are tasting and bringing out and and this is what Andy's talking about that's being supported by the roast. Great, great set of comments. He says the mouthfeel for me is thick, juicy, and mouthwatering, and the energy is awakening all my senses. Oh, great comment. Energy comment. It's awakening all the senses. Who made this comment? Aggie. Aggie. It, yeah, is, is uh, awakening all the senses. I love this comment because she took the word, Aggie took the word energetics and said, wait a minute, the energetics really are about waking up my entire palate, waking up my entire nose, all the senses that go into this. This is a fair and great usage of the word energetics and how to understand it. And in China, they would use it like this. Great, great comment. Yes. I believe she and Rob must have been typing simultaneously. Oh. And he shares this as well. This tea is opening my sensory range. I didn't realize I was trampled by elephants, a.k.a. cats, in my sleep until I sipped this tea. So, this is this is great. Uh, Rob comments how this is opening up his range, uh, sensory range. And... Again, this is the same type of comment in the sense that it's bringing us to, to be here. And by being here, we sense everything that's occurring around us, especially what's occurring in this tea. And this is the magic of going through the quality arena like this. And you're demonstrating it in a great way, yes. Okay. Do I love this tea? The answer is I absolutely do love this tea. 
I appreciate for all the reasons that you have brought up. And actually, when people come in the shop and they say to me, I haven't done a cliff tea before. And so I go through the spiel, you want light roast, medium roast, or heavy roast. If they say medium to heavy roast, I almost always start here because this is relatively easy to grab a hold of once you go through slowly enough, once you're present. And this forces you, by the way, to go through slowly because it's so hot. And so this is one of the reasons I really, really wanted to do this tea with you because I knew that although it's on what some people call the primer board, it's still powerful and relevant overall to understanding fifteens. Yes. Peter shares, I'm finding the same as Aggie and Rob energetically. What I might compare the difference to is a green tea where here there's also a more grounding connection inside as I feel my senses open up. Oh, this is great. So Peter says there's a similarity between his feelings of, of being, his senses being engaged, just as Aggie and Rob have said. But then he makes a comparison with green tea. And he says this is much more grounding. And so I love this commentary. And I'll tell you why. Generally speaking, pure green tea is full of energy. And it's almost always a swirl of energy. This is not a swirl of energy. This is, oh, I got to get myself in a space. That's the first thing. Secondly, the tea response, I'll help get you into that space. Thirdly, oh my gosh, you've opened up my senses so that I can appreciate this tea in these surroundings. So all three of you, Aggie, Rob, and, and Peter have zoned in on what they would talk about in China for interjects. I love that because sometimes in the West, there's a misunderstanding about interjects, just as there's a misunderstanding sometimes about chi, because it's sometimes all of this stuff is linked almost to like a god has thrown down something in front of you. No, that's not what this is. None of this in the original text was meant that way. They were all meant to address certain way we interact with nature around us. This is part of nature. And we're interacting with that. And so I love your commentary about that. Now, I'm sure while we all enjoy this commentary, I'm sure some of you are thinking, you're probably a little late. I am a little late. And we should wrap this up. And I should wrap this up. And I will. So here are the things I want you to take away from today. First off, make sure you take great notes because today you hit it out of the ballpark with the energetics. Secondly, the nose comments. That was out of the ballpark. Hornness and wheat berry. That stands in my head. The others were on, on track, but those stand out in my head. And then Andy's extremely perceptive comment about the roast being the foundation with a forward part of the foundation, and then you enter the structure and you get the other part that this roast foundation holds. What a great analogy. You guys must be smart. You are smart. I salute all of your commentary today. It was great. I love being on this journey with all of you. Next week, what I'm really looking for, you know, usually I go up to a monastery for enlightenment, right? But not next week. I'm going to spend my time with you for enlightenment. 
your responsibility this week, stay healthy. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye now. <laughs>